so today we're going to talk about uh, social choice functions which basically help you aggregate the preferences of a population into one choice and um, we're going to start off with uh, boolean functions a uh, boolean function is a little bit different from what we see there it's a function from the set of 2 to the power n tuples with entries in minus 1 comma 1 like that to which map to r uh, for uh, at least for two candidate uh, social choice functions we only care about uh, the functions with range minus 1 comma 1 so this can be thought of as a voting rule or a social choice function for an election with uh, two candidates and n voters um, so the choice of the the preferences of the voters uh, map to the winner uh, so what are some examples of uh, some social choice functions the most uh, popular example everyone probably knows of is the majority function which uh, if you have uh, mo mo more frequent minus ones in your voting entry then it's uh, minus one otherwise it's plus one it can be represented as the sign of uh, the sum of all the entries in x uh, you can also uh, generalize this to a weighted majority which is uh, just majority with each vote having a different weight so say you have uh, the entry plus one plus one and plus one or plus one minus one uh, plus one then you can have uh, two times plus one minus four times uh, five times minus one plus two times one to get a negative vote even though there are more positive votes in number uh, you have the popular dictator function which uh, just returns the i th takes takes x and returns the i th coordinate of x um, and you have the tribes function which uh, basically what it does is you have s uh, tribes uh, and uh, each tribe consists of a w tuple and uh, this tuple basically uh, so all the people in the 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 and function of uh, all the votes in the tuple is taken and uh, the or function is taken on that uh, set of uh, tribes so if any uh, one tribe votes unanimously that is the choice of the um, unanimously to uh, the plus one candidate then that is the choice of the tribes function so does everyone understand the tribes function or should i make that clear i guess i'll move on uh, so the tribes function doesn't have a particular uh, application in real life but it's important in uh, analyzing uh, these kinds of functions and we will see it later again um, so now we'll talk about some uh, properties uh, that might uh, be desirable in a good uh, social choice function. Uh, the first property is the monotone property, which says that if uh, x is less than equals y coordinate wise, then uh, the the choice of the population is less than uh, so f x is less than equals f y. Uh, the next property is the odd property, which is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the unanimous property says that if all people vote a particular way, that should be the result and uh, the transitive symmetric property basically says that all coordinates have equal uh, status in the voting system so if you take any two coordinates and uh, there must exist a permutation that maps the first coordinate to the second coordinate and uh, for all x the permutation doesn't change the result so fx is the same if you apply uh, the permutation to x so does everyone get that um, yeah, and a stronger condition that you know implies transitive symmetry is symmetry, which basically says that uh, the function only depends on the number of plus or minus ones. It so it it is uh, the same. So if you have f(x) and you apply a permutation to it, uh, f(x) uh, permuted doesn't change. Uh, so these are some properties which we might like, and uh, we can. Uh, if you see, uh, majority is the only Boolean function that satisfies all of these properties, and. Uh, so and uh, we can see why the last property is important because the dictator f dictatorship function uh, doesn't satisfy this property uh, clearly if uh, you permute uh, the ith coordinate to something else the result will never be the same so the dictatorship function doesn't have this property and as a result it's a bad choice for a social function like we already know and uh, the tribes function has the property that it's monotone unanimous and transitive symmetric too so it might form a good candidate for a social choice function as well also uh, we assume 
uh, not assume, uh, another property that we might like in a social choice function is that uh, it's unbiased, meaning there's, it's equally likely to elect plus or minus one. And uh, we assume usually that voter preferences, uh, meaning the x, the input is independent, uh, each of the coordinates in the input are independent and uniformly random. Uh, that is called the impartial culture assumption. So uh, now that we have seen some functions that uh, are really, uh, that might form good candidates for social choice functions, we, m we want to uh, find a way to analyze these functions and you know find what other properties might be desirable in such functions. Uh, we do that using the concept of influence. So uh, what exactly is influence? It's kind of the effect the ith voter or the ith coordinate in X can have on the function f. So in some sense, what is the power of the of each voter in choosing the eventual winner, so to say? And uh, something interesting about the history of influence is it was first discovered by a geneticist called uh, Lionel Penrose. And it was individually rediscovered in 1965 by this lawyer called Banzaf who was uh, trying to prove that uh, election in Nassau County in New York was uh, had uh, had 16 percent of where 16 percent of the voters had zero influence in that election and that in that election was uh, conducted by a weighted majority which we talked about before so that's pretty interesting and so we'll see what the formal definition of influence is but for that we first need this definition uh, here uh, we say that the coordinate i uh, which is uh, 1 of 1 to n is uh, pivotal for a function f on an input x if fx is not equals fx o plus i where x o plus i is just x with the ith coordinate flipped. So we are saying it's pivotal if we change the ith coordinate from say minus 1 to plus 1 the vote also changes from minus 1 to plus 1 say or plus 1 to minus 1. Uh, now we are ready to define what influence is. So the influence of a coordinate i on a function f is basically the probability that uh, uh, probability that given a random x, uh, the ith coordinate uh, is pivotal for that x. So here what we're basically doing is uh, checking for all x if the ith coordinate is pivotal. And if it is, we're counting those, all the pivotal coordinates and dividing it by 2 to the power n because that is the number of x's we have to obtain the probability. So is everything clear f till now or any clarifications? No, that's good. Um, so a toy example is just the i dictator function. Uh, we have that the coordinate uh, i in the dictator function uh, chi i, which is takes the ith coordinate and returns that, is pivotal for every input x because if you flip the ith coordinate, the result of the dictator will also flip, right? And uh, if j not equals i, then j cannot be uh, pivotal because uh, if you flip j it will have no effect on the dictator function right uh, so that's a example to clarify what influence exactly is and uh, another way to analytically study influence because it might be hard to calculate uh, expectations all the time is the def is uh, the concept of a derivative so the derivative is uh, operator is is an operator which takes uh, which uh, which is defined on some coordinate i and uh, defined on a function f uh, what the function does, it takes a function in minus 1 comma 1 n to r and maps it to a, a function in minus 1 comma 1 n to r also and uh, it's defined as that. Basically x uh, with that notation implies that uh, you take x and fix all the coordinates other than the ith coordinate and uh, you s x i set to 1 is uh, the ith coordinate set to 1 and x i set to minus 1 is the ith coordinate set to minus 1 and you calculate this uh, this expression basically. So why is this useful? Uh, it's useful because uh, if you calculate uh, that for a pivotal coordinate, that value is 0 because uh, f, if you go back, the this, this thing and that thing are equal in a, for a, wait, I get this right. Oh. For a non-pivotal coordinate, this thing and that thing is equal because the ith coordinate, if the ith coordinate changes, our result stays the same. So di fx is zero when the ith coordinate is not pivotal, and when the ith coordinate is pivotal, uh, the result exactly flips. So it's either plus or minus one. 
uh, that's what we have here uh, so di fx uh, squared is uh, the zero one indicator for whether i is pivotal for x so if di fx squared is zero then i is not pivotal if di fx is one then i is pivotal fx squared sorry uh, and this is a simple expression that we get uh, by just a little bit of calculation so the the influence of i on f is the expectation over all x that d of uh, di fx squared and that is uh, kind of uh, easy to see because uh, we defined the influence as uh, the probability that it flips and that is precisely the expectation that uh, di fx is 1 now uh, we need some uh, more fundamental tools to actually prove things about influence so we're going to talk about some uh, Fourier analysis of these boolean functions so uh, the Fourier expansion of a boolean function f from minus 1 comma 1 to n to the to r that maps to r is a represent is its representation as a real multilinear polynomial and this multilinear polynomial has uh, these monomials that are defined by uh, set subsets of n and uh, the monomial is simply x to the s is uh, the product of all the uh, the product of all the xi such that the i's are in s so does everyone get that the definition is a little confusing i'll explain the two to the power n part later that's fine just the monomial corresponding to that and the empty monomial the co the monomial corresponding to the empty set is uh, one uh, so now we can prove that every function can be written in the form uh, some coefficient times these uh, these monomials summed over all the subsets of n so there are exactly two to the power n monomials and uh, 2 to the power n coefficients and we just call these coefficients uh, f hat s and they're called the Fourier coefficients corresponding to the set s for f so just to clarify this with an example and make it easier uh, we can consider the boolean function that uh, takes returns the maximum of two bits so max of uh, plus one and plus one is one uh, max of plus one and minus one is plus one and so on uh, and we can uh, easily check that uh, this is the same as taking this uh, polynomial that is half plus half x1 plus half x2 minus half x1 x2 uh, and now to calculate the Fourier coefficients we simply read off these uh, coefficients and uh, these are our corresponding uh, Fourier coefficients so the Fourier coefficient corresponding to uh, the new uh, null set is half the Fourier co coefficient corresponding to the to x the set containing x1 is half and so on so does ev everyone understand this example at least what i'm trying to say is every boolean function can be written as a polynomial of this form where the monomials in the polynomial are indexed by the subsets of uh, the set containing n elements and the coefficients of these monomials are just called the Fourier coefficients of uh, the function so does everyone get that or any questions about it okay I guess I'll move on uh, the functions uh, of the f of this form that uh, the boolean functions make a vector space of dimension uh, 2 to the power n over r you can see this by uh, so our every uh, function uh, is uh, basically taking uh, defining uh, a result for 2 to the power n values in minus 1 comma 1 to the n so you can stack them as a column vector basically so say we have x1 x2 to the power n in minus 1 comma 1 to n then we can stack all the f x1 to fx uh, 2n 2 to the power n in a column vector and all these sets of column vectors corresponding to each function are the elements of the vector space and it's clear that they form a vector space over r of dimension 2 to the power n um, now this uh, vector space is a 
of dimension 2 to the power n and we have 2 to the power n functions of the form x to the s and uh, as we saw before from our expansion uh, that uh, they kind of span uh, all the function of these forms span the span the space of uh, functions so they form a basis uh, for this vector space and in fact it's an orthonormal basis uh, now we can define an inner product on this uh, vector space which uh, takes any two functions and uh, the inner product is defined as the expectation over x of fx gx and we can prove that this gives a very natural formula for the Fourier coefficient corresponding to s which is f hat s is the inner product of f comma x to raise to s and that is the expectation of fx uh, xs x raised to s over all x and uh, this follows from the fact that uh, the x's form an orthonormal basis and uh, we'll just note this uh, theorem called the Parsevals theorem which basically says that all the the inner product of f and f uh, f taken to itself is uh, just the sum of the Fourier coefficients of f so going back to uh, influence uh, we have uh, now a expansion for f in in terms of a multilinear po polynomial with real coefficients that are the Fourier coefficients of f and uh, we can apply di to that expansion to op obtain this uh, expression for the for di fx that is easier to compute than how we were computing di fx earlier if you note and uh, this uh, gives us this uh, theorem uh, with this expression that says di fx is just the sum over all uh, polynomials with the coefficients that have with the indices that uh, with all the sets that contain the indices i and if we apply Parseval's theorem to this, the one that we noted earlier, we'll uh, get uh, that the influence of the index i over the function f is simply all the sum of all the Fourier coefficients squared, where uh, we are considering all the subsets that have the index i in them. And uh, this is kind of important because uh, this shows us the power of uh, Fourier analysis uh, because it gives us a very easy and like straightforward way of computing the influence of a index over a function uh, by just calculating the, this uh, simple sum that we get from the Fourier expansion. Uh, now wh why are we talking about influences and derivatives of uh, f uh, and f defining derivatives and stuff. The point is that uh, we want uh, functions uh, that have that give each voter a small power no voter should have a uh, large influence over the election because that would not exactly be a good election and ideally you would have uh, an election where the uh, the influence of each voter or the power of each voter is distributed well amongst each voter and is small so that no one person or a group of people can influence the election and uh, that is exactly what this theorem gives us uh, this theorem tells us that if we have a transitive symmetric and monotone function which uh, both majority and uh, the tribes function satisfy then the influence of uh, the any index over that function is less than equals 1 by square root n which is a pretty small quantity. Um, uh, so as I said the majority and the tribes function satisfy this these properties and uh, this is where the importance of the tribes function kind of comes into play because uh, if you notice the majority function has uh, influence even for large n which is very similar to that quantity it's just a small constant uh, constant times smaller than this quantity there but uh, the tribes function has an influence that is just uh, the natural log of n divided by n times some constant uh, which is uh, pretty small compared to the majority and that's why the tribes function is kind of important um, so yeah why did we talk about influences and stuff uh, and uh, you know why, why is the analysis important it's uh, important because it gives us a characterization for a good voting function 
uh, what is a good so when we ask ourselves what is a good voting function we want it uh, like we said in slide one we want it to be monotone or unanimous and symmetric we also might want that it's unbiased and according to John Jacques Rougeau, uh, I don't know what, how to pronounce that, uh, the ideal voting rule is one which maximizes the number of votes which agree with the outcome. So this, theor good, this theorem gives us a good characterization of uh, what, what kind of functions uh, maximize uh, the number of votes that agree with the outcome. It says that if we have any voting rule for a two candidate election and uh, some votes X then uh, the number of votes that agree with the outcome is directly proportional to that qu quantity right here which is uh, the sum of all the degree one uh, Fourier coefficients uh, meaning all the Fourier coefficients of the sets containing only one element so the expected value of w or w itself is uh, directly proportional to that sum so whenever we are looking for a good voting rule or voting function we want to maximize that sum basically and uh, that is exactly what uh, majority does. Uh, we already know that majority is the only function that is uh, monotone, odd, and symmetric. But in fact, majority is the unique maximizer. All the majority functions are the unique maximizers of this expression right here. And that means that uh, the majority is the unique function that, uh, that agrees with this uh, rule of uh, Rousseau, which says uh, that the number of votes which agree with the outcome should be maximized. Now, uh, that was about uh, two candidate voting rules. Uh, but uh, what about if we move beyond two candidates to say three or four or even five candidates? So uh, in for three party elections, uh, Condorcet suggested in his essay that uh, we could conduct uh, three elections. So we say we have three candidates A, B, and C. We could conduct an election between A, B, B, C, and uh, C, A and uh, you know decide uh, and use any function to conduct those individual elections and aggregate those elections somehow uh, and each and he suggested using majority for each of those uh, particular two party elections and uh, he suggested that uh, you get a winner when a candidate wins against all his wins all his elections so if there's a election a versus b b versus c and C versus A, the candidate is a Condorcet winner if, uh, say A is a Condorcet winner if he wins against a, B, A beats B and A beats C. Uh, so we can consider a particular Condorcet election, say we have A and B with the tags plus 1 and minus 1, B and C with the tags plus 1 and minus 1 and similarly C and A and these are some voter preferences and FX is an aggregation function. Uh, it could be majority or dictatorship or tribes, what have you. Uh, now, if you just consider the first three votes and say that election makes up is made of just three those three votes, right? Um, just a second. So, say the election is made up of just those three votes, then uh, in the first case, the winner is A and say we are using majority in this example so we are using majority on three bits with three people so in the first case uh, a wins two votes and b wins one vote so in the first case a beats b a similarly in the second case b beats c and in the third case a beats c so A is a Condorcet winner here because it won all its elections, whereas B and C are not Condorcet winners because they lost at least one election, right? Uh, so it seems like a problem is solved, but uh, it isn't. The problem is uh, we have we can have a paradox, uh, and how would we have that? Uh, say in our election here, we switched the vote of uh, C from minus one. Uh, we switch the vote of number the voter number two from minus one to plus one then instead of uh, a winning the election here c wins it so now we have a is greater than b b is greater than c and c is greater than a but this is a paradox because uh, a the, uh, the the first the choice the aggregation prefers 
A over B, B over C, and C over A. So we have no Condorcet winner here. And this is referred to as the Condorcet paradox, where the outcome has uh, is one of the one of minus one minus one minus one or one 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 in which in both cases where we don't have a clear Condorcet winner and this uh, forms the Condorcet paradox so the next thing you might say is uh, we're using majority here so you know maybe it's just a problem with majority maybe majority leads to Condorcet paradoxes uh, and maybe like there are other functions that we can use as aggregation functions here so other f's we can use that are not majority that do not lead to the Condorcet paradox but uh, this is where the brilliance of uh, Arrow's theorem comes in. Arrow's theorem states that if you have any unanimous voting rule that is used in a three candidate Condorcet election, then F must be a dictatorship. And uh, Arrow proved this theorem in uh, 1951, and he, I think he won the Nobel Prize for this theorem. Uh, and this is pretty striking because it basically says that uh, if you want all the desirable uh, desirable properties in your voting function and you want three candidates or maybe more than three then you will always have your your function voting function must be a dictatorship which is clearly not what we want and uh, Jill Kalai who is a computer scientist proved uh, this other theorem that implies the arrows theorem and he proved this in 2002 using techniques in boolean functions that we just saw and uh, his proof says that uh, if you have a three candidate Condorcet election and uh, you have the impartial culture assumption which is uniformly random and independent votes from each voter uh, the probability of a Condorcet winner is precisely this expression now I won't uh, say what the stability uh, of f exactly is because it's kind of complicated to explain but uh, we want the but you can clearly see that we want the stability to be as low as possible even it's even better if it's in negative because then we have the maximum probability of having a Condorcet winner uh, in fact uh, and uh, if you calculate the stability of uh, the dictatorship function it comes out to exactly negative 1 by 4 and then the probability of having a Condorcet winner is exactly 1 so a dictatorship is the perfect solution uh, now why is uh, Kalai's proof any better than uh, Arrow's because it's because he his proof is one an analytical proof and it gives us a lot of other important results that uh, help us find out you know much more about uh, the, the behavior of Condorcet elections and uh, what does it give us it gives us that uh, it gives us first that the arrows, the arrows theorem as a corollary and it also gives us something called the Gilbaud's formula which says in a three candidate Condorcet election using majority the probability of finding a winner is 91% which is pretty good if you think about it and that's what we use uh, in three candidate functions uh, in I think France I'm not sure but there's something like that used and uh, also it also gives us this really striking theorem which is is kind of stronger than Arrow's theorem. It says that if you have a three candidate Condorcet election with the function f the prob and the probability of a Condorcet winner is 1 minus epsilon so if epsilon is small the probability is high then you are uh, at most o epsilon close you're, you're o epsilon close to uh, the dictatorship function. So what that means is uh, the higher the probability of finding a Condorcet winner by a voting rule the closer your function is to the dictatorship function and this is uh, in some sense much stronger than the Arrow's theorem. Arrow's theorem just says you know the only perfect voting function is dictatorship this 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 says something much stronger it says if you have a function that is really nice and it's giving you a correct outcome most of the time you're very close to a dictatorship function which is again bad now uh, so after reading this uh, after reading Arrow's theorem I was really dejected because you know we didn't have we don't have a good voting function that's kind of bad but turns out uh, arrow didn't consider these uh, uh, these functions uh, which are basically or voting systems rather which are basically uh, score voting systems which uh, basically you assign a score to each candidate and uh, these voting systems don't suffer with Condorcet's paradox you can get a winner every time and they also satisfy all those good properties so you can find out more about uh, those voting functions in this link uh, the most of the material from my talk is from the from chapter 2 of this excellent book on 
Boolean functions by Ryan O'Donnell and I'm taking a course on it right now which is great with Eric Blay um, and you can find out Jill Kala's proof uh, at this place. Uh, thank you, that was my talk.